Okay. Okay, now we can start. Hello, everyone. I am Editri Baskoro. Uh, good evening and also uh, good afternoon and good morning uh, to all of you uh, in various time zones. Uh, welcome again to our combinatoric uh, today's series. We are very happy to see you again in this series. And first of all, I would like to extend our gratitude to the Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, ITB, Professor Wahyu Sri Gutomo, for the constant support uh, to this uh, event. And in fact, he's uh, always here with us to allocate his valuable time. So thank you, uh, <laughs> Professor Wahyu. <Good> pleasure. <laughs> and, and our big welcome to <clears throat> our speaker today. Professor Stan, uh, Stanislav Rasesovsky, one of the world uh, prominent combinatorists. As we know that uh, he is uh, the author of the famous survey paper entitled Small Ramsey Numbers, published uh, in Electronic Journal of Combinatorics. And this paper updated regularly, and now I think it has been cited uh, 857 times. I hope I'm, um, I'm right to uh, mention this number. So I think uh, everyone who works on Ramsey uh, already read this uh, paper. Hello, Professor Rasistowski. How are you today? Hello, I'm great. Great Thank honor to be invited. Thank, thank you very nice much for, for accepting, uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, <clears throat> so in this occasion, uh, I would also like to uh, welcome all colleagues, friends, and students who are attending this uh, program. We are very happy to see you again uh, in this program. As we know that this program is organized by the combinatorial Mathematics Research Group, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences Institute Technology Bandung. And this year we will have uh, 14 editions uh, and uh, the speakers, are all, uh, <clears throat> all outstanding combinatories from various countries. And this uh, today event is the seventh uh, talk in this uh, year. And now we are all uh, very excited and honored to have Professor uh, Stanislav Rasesowski from Rochester Institute of uh, Technology, USA. And he will deliver a lecture with the title More on Computational Approach in Ramsey Theory. And this uh, lecture will be chaired by Dr. Rinovia Simanjunta. Before I give the control to Dr. Reno, I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences, uh, Professor Wahyu Srikutomo, to give a welcoming speech. Professor Wahyu, uh, please, your time. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Edi Paedi. Uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, uh, ITB, I am extremely overwhelmed to get this opportunity <laughs> to address you all on this uh, combinatory uh, today series. And a special thanks go to Professor Stanislaw Radzizowski, uh, who will be giving his lecture uh, today. And I hope that this meeting, which it is a continuation of uh, meetings, uh, a series of combinatory uh, meetings will uh, benefit all of us uh, uh, in strengthen our uh, 
comprehension and knowledge also, uh, especially in graph theory or combinatorics, uh, Ramsey theory and uh, combinatorial computing. And uh, I hope all the participants, uh, professors, lecturers, researchers, and all students uh, can enjoy and having this uh, lecture valuable. Thank you very much once again, and please enjoy this uh, lecture. Thank you, Paedi. Thank, thank you, Professor Wahyu. And now before uh, I'm giving to uh, Iburino, let us uh, have a photo together. So Pa Adit, please uh, help us to have a photo together, group photo. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would like to ask you to open your video so we can have, uh, so I can take the screenshot. Can we have a photo together? Okay. <laughs> okay, maybe I will uh count down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, maybe once more. 3, 2, 1. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. And thank you. <clears throat> and now I would like to invite Dr. Reno to share this session. Okay, thank you, Pairi. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to see all of you here, although it is already 7 p.m. <laughs> Bandung time. But I also would like to welcome uh, all our colleagues uh, and students from uh, all over the world. I think I saw uh, Professor Wanida Hemaku here from Thailand and also some other uh, colleagues. So uh, welcome to the seventh edition of um, uh, combinatorial today series and our speaker tonight will be uh, Professor Stanil Stanislav Radziskowski and I would like to uh, mention something from uh, several things from his CV uh, although I know that uh, Professor Radziskowski uh, doesn't really need uh, introduction uh, in the uh, uh, Ramsey community. And just a second. So can you see my slide now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. Okay. All right. So uh, <laughs> Professor Radziskowski graduated uh, from the University of Warsaw in 1980. Uh, with a PhD in mathematics and computer science. And he uh, started his academic position in uh, UNAM in Mexico. And then uh, he moved to uh, the United States, uh, Rochester Uni Institute of Technology in 1984. And as we all know, uh, his um, main uh, research interest is in combin uh, in computational aspects of combinatoric problems, and uh, as of today, uh, in Scopus there are uh, seventy five research articles uh, cited for uh, under his name, and I think I should mention some of the most uh, famous uh, articles from Professor Radiskowski. The first one, of course, is this one. Uh, joint paper with Professor Brandon McKay, who is also present tonight. Uh, this is the exact value for R4 and 5, which is 25. 
uh, this was uh, published uh, a long time ago in 1995. And there is also another paper. I think this gave a bound for our, is it 5.5 five or? Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And also a paper, a joint paper with Professor Brandon McKay. And of course, as uh, Eddie, pa Eddie mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is the highly cited uh, survey paper about Ramsey numbers. Uh, it was published in the Electronic Journal on Combinatorics. And I think if, if we write something about Ramsey number, there should be this paper in the reference. I think uh, uh, that's just a very uh, uh, short introduction to Professor Radziszkowski. So I will let Professor Radziszkowski to present his uh, talk tonight, uh, uh, entitled More on Computational Ap Approach in Ramsey Theory. Theory. So Professor Radziszkowski, the time and the screen is yours. Okay, I'm trying, I'm sorry. Now it, does it work? No, that's yeah, different. Yeah. It, it yeah. works. It, it works. works, but probably not in the very beginning. Yes. Is yeah. the right slide on the yes, screen? Yes, it is. Okay. It is. So, Perfect. Thanks a lot for a very kind introduction. I really feel so grateful for being invited here, and uh, I've never been in that part of the world, but finally I am. So <laughs> I will, you know, put it on my CV and be proud of this entry. First, let me explain a little the first word in the title, namely more. This refers to the fact that Professor Brendan McKay, with whom I worked on a number of projects, right, gave a wonderful talk months ago in this series, where he focused on computational breakthrough. They jointly with uh, Angel Pied obtained recently on the upper bound or R55. This is by far the most famous computational result in Ramsey theory. So my talk will talk about other, maybe less known problems, but very similar or kind of similar to what Brendan was talking about. Now, to begin, I could not resist to point to some similarities in parallel between our countries. <laughs> I'm from <laughs> Poland, and we do. We love Ramsey theory, and so you do, right? There is actually a very impressive group in Bandung, around, uh, organized mainly by Professor Pasparo, who is, and all the members of the group are uh, doing great work and investigating various aspects of Ramsey. And I wish you great success, more yeah. great success in the future. Now, this flag <coughs> is obviously no valid for both of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> the one at the bottom on the right is Polish flag. Mm -hmm. So, when I have it vertical, it refers to both. Yeah. A rough plan of my talk is as follows. I will briefly tell about counting numbers and where do we stand on general, compute, mainly computational bounds. Then I will talk a little about what I call diagonal conjecture about growth of Ramsey numbers, but motivated mainly by computational experience. 
I will focus then a little on uh, one, I think very important, but not much studied, Ramsey number. This is four colors avoiding triangles. So the question is, what is the maximum number of vertices of the complete graph so that one can, using four colors, color all the edges so that no monochromatic triangle emerges and the current bounds are as marked here. And I will talk a little more about that. And then maybe a little less known <coughs> branch, I would say of Ramsey theory concerning Folkman numbers and Folkman problems, which is the deeper study of Ramsey arrowing operator with some additional constraints. So the definition is an avoidable RGH for graphs G and H is the Ramsey number equal to N if and only if N is the least integer such that if the edges of the complete graph on N vertices are colored with two colors, then either it must contain monochromatic G in the first color or H in the second color. So that's classics mm -hmm. for two colors. And very often one omits graphs if they are complete graphs and then one refers to Ramsey numbers R and N. This generalizes to many colors, to more colors, arbitrary graphs and very active area around that is, uh, I would say is, is well and alive for a very long time and I hope it will be for much more time. Now, these numbers do exist, that's very important. And uh, that's what is explored. These two graphs are kind of unavoidable classics. So on the left, we have a coloring of the edges of K part with two colors without monochromatic triangle. And on six vertices, it cannot be done thus showing R3, 3 equal six. For larger graphs, we usually display just one of the colors, like in this case for the parameters three, five, a graph on 13 vertices drawn here does not have a triangle, while its complement has no independent set of five vertices. And in this case also, this cannot be accomplished on 14 vertices. Both statements together mean that R35 is 14. Both theoretical and experimental study is going on for many, many decades. And I'm displaying here the best known currently general bound in the diagonal case. Note that the lower bound, you know, a slight improvement by Spencer of the classical Erdős result shows this inequality. Now we had some, uh, you see the speed is slow here, but say in 2010, Conlon got the bound which is here, and there was an exciting slide, but very exciting improvement to it in 2020, where this exponential form just decreased a little. Still, the main driving term is this 2n choose n, which is obtained from fairly straightforward uh, basic inductive reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, there are, I cannot, 
Two days. What's happening? Yes. Okay. I clicked something wrong and it didn't <laughs> let me reveal the next part. So with these diagonal or, or the, the main numbers, there are two conjectures associated. The first one, how fast? Okay, we know they, they grow quite fast, but if you take the nth root of that, does this converge to what is the limit and if it exists, how fast it grows? So that remains to be a conjecture and that limit because of the bounds presented here. So the lower bound gives the square root of two for the limit if it exists and by analyzing the binomial coefficient, which is close to Catalan number, right, gives the upper bound four. This remains open and probably extremely difficult to go any further on that. On the other hand, the other limit does exist. We know that if you increase the number of colors, but keep the size of avoided click fixed. In this case, it's triangle, such limit exists. And much of my talk, okay, or in my talk, I will refer to this limit several times. So we know, we don't know whether it's finite or infinite, but we try to look a little more into it and uh, connect to other problems and not on. Now, back paddling a little, what we can compute with Ramsey. Okay, so I'm listing here three types of problems. The first one, you know, you have a graph and you graph G and you want to show if it's a lower bound on the Ramsey number R M N. Well, it's just testing the click number and independence number of this graph. And that's a cool, straightforward homework for students in appropriate course. Now, the thing becomes a little harder. If you want to make this graph on as many vertices as possible, or, well, to improve the lower bound. There is a large number of people trying to do this for various constant parameters M and N, and in particular in computer science, because it is very appealing to computer science students who can understand what needs to be done pretty quickly, and they can embark on experiments very so, and many people did it in the past, and I hope they will do it in the future. Still, the maximal credit, the, the champion of the area, definitely is Geoffrey Exel, who for several decades amazed us a few times with wonderful both heuristics and constructions, improving the best known lower bounds in several cases. The thing gets much harder if you want to get the upper bound in this. Well, you need to show that there does not exist graph with the properties as listed here. And in some cases or in several small cases where you want to make such exhaustive claims, you, you, you have to dive into the generation pruning and graph isomorphism problems. And then needless to say, it's very hard to do it with a wonderful tool like Noti Traces by Brenda. And what we heard months ago was, I would say, a masterpiece of such project where the new upper bound on R55 was obtained. Now, you mentioned kindly my survey paper, small Ramsey numbers, and that's the main table for classical two color 
numbers in the most recent edition from 2021. So what you can see, well, several small numbers have exact value, but when two bounds are listed, that's the lower bound, that's the upper bound. And I was, you know, trying to enhance this table. Most bounds belong to different researchers, but Brendan and Wigley came and made the following disaster. Okay, they got the new upper bound on R5, but if you look at it in detail, and if you push further the technique for R55, they say, actually, we may ask Brendan later how big improvements and uh, when and what we can expect. But my understanding is that similar linear programming techniques cause an avalanche of improvements to upper bounds of all the upper bounds crossed here in that. So once the consequences of R55, the computational consequences of R55 are pushed through higher parameters, now that's what we can expect. All of these bounds will be the yeah. consequence of, of the work we heard about months ago. But looking at this table, one can observe the following. So I'm switching the gears a little and will tell you a few things about what I call diagonal conjecture. Blue marked numbers go down as you move away from the diagonal. Here is the diagonal. So do yellow. So do green, so do blue. Moving away from the diagonal. Oh, I have marked lower bounds because we don't have exact value. Yet the feeling among many people is that the lower bounds are much closer to true values than upper bounds. There is one little hiccup here, namely, if you look at 8, 10, and 7, 11, you can see that it's not going smoothly down. But I would rather think of it, well, in two ways. Try to improve the lower bound. It should be feasible. Or that. Another intuition, obviously, it's a conjecture, would be that the farther you go for larger parameters, that perhaps more uh, that, that this phenomenon is perhaps possible to prove or argue better. Okay, so that's in symbols. It's exactly what was marked in colors on the previous slide. Right. If you move, if you move down away from the diagonal of the table, then the number decreases. The same thing can be similar conjecture can be stated for multiple colors. Right. If you have, say, two last colors, then moving away from the diagonal we think decreases the number. Now, it's not, it's evidence-based, right? It was probably observed by many people over a long time, but you know, you observe it and there is not much to say, okay. Or it looked like there was not much to say about it. So I'm trying to fill that hole.
Known bounds and values do not contradict BC, which stands for diagonal conjecture here. Interestingly, there is a paper which claims to have a proof for it, but well, I, I think it's firmly now established that the proof, okay, the proof is not complete, does not hold, right? So there was an attempt and there is a paper, but it remains a conjecture, an open thing. Let me go back a little to the limit because we will try to link the two subjects. So <clears throat> here we increase the number of colors. R, R of K is avoiding complete graph on uh, K for all of the colors, same value, and that's R colors. So as I remarked at the beginning in one of the first slides, Chong and Grinstead prove there's a nice elegant argument that this limit exists. Well, it can be finite on infinite, but we know for certain that this limit exists. Buried in some old papers are hints that suggest that Erdos was inclined to think that this limit is Infinite. Okay, inclined to think that's what actually appears in two places. At the moment, however, the best lower bound for L3 is this number 3.199, which emerges as the sixth root from 1073. And it's quite old, it's almost 20 years old. Interestingly, the same reasoning is valid for any K, so exactly the same argument as Chong and Grinstein. Grinstead shows that the limits are R K to power one over R do exist and they are Finite or infinite. So it is hopelessly difficult to compute these limits or to make strong claims about that. But it gets quite nice if one assumes the diagonal conjecture. So that's what I will show now in the first, in the next few slides that suppose that BC holds. No, by no means we don't have any abstract proof or even half proof of that. It's based on evidence, but suppose that it holds, then interesting things can be played about the limits L K mentioned on the previous one. So first we begin with the old construction by Abbott from 1965 that the lower bound for this Ramsey number, two R colors, avoiding complete graph on A, well, can be, the lower bound can be witnessed by the Cartesian product of constructions for A minus one and A plus one on R and R colors. And this is easily, okay, the, the sketch or the, the main step in the proof is that you apply the DC R times to R, 2R of A, no, by going phase of A minus one and A plus one R times. And then, at least to me, or I have to think more about it, uh, the following, to me, little counterintuitive theorem can be proven. Okay, the theorem is subject to DC, 
right? The DC holds, then the finiteness of the first one, the simplest, the, the, the basic one, implies the finiteness of all the others. At least no one could have intuition that that goes the other way, but it is as here, and one can do it in two steps. Now, full details are in the associated paper. There is a paper uh, on the C where we spell out all the details of the proof. By the way, that's the joint work with Mainland. Young and Xiao Nong Shu. So, some wrestling with fractions and one by induction on A can prove this inequality. And then another theorem can be stated that the limit of this ratio, so that's normally we look at one of these, but now you try to look at its ratio. And in, interestingly, if you go far enough with the click size, right, one can force this ratio to exceed two to power r, and then putting the things together, uh, one can finish this proof. Okay. So I, I just Hinted, pointed to the main, the main steps involved in the proof, and anybody interested, I really encourage to look at the paper. Here is, however, the summary, you know, the main, the, the conclusion from this relationship between the DC and the limit. We don't know whether any of these limits is finite or infinite. But the DC implies that all of them are finite or all of them are infinite. They, they stick together. That's, I think, an interesting statement. And furthermore, if L3 is finite, then they form a chain and they grow. So this assumption now we must be main because otherwise well, all are infinities and, and that wouldn't be much. Interestingly, for growing K, these limits themselves, they tend to infinity. And this is actually an absolute claim without assuming PC. So they may well be all finite, but still tends to infinity. And then the intuition, okay, as we look, and we will in the next 10 minutes or so, as we look at actual values or other claims connected to LK, and if we have this Inside, well, I wouldn't call it inside, or thinking that the lower bounds, currently known best lower bounds, are closer to the actual value than upper bound, then this would add weight to the potential outcome that all of these limits are fine. Certainly, I mentioned that. Okay, if DCSD stands for this conjecture for concrete aspect P, so nothing out there contradicts it, no, no known data contradicts it, but actually more, it does call for all S less than five, and actually as far as S plus P up to 12, with one, not exception, with one open case, right? We don't know enough about six, six to 
judge whether DC 66 holds or not. And then as a side summary of, of the statements we made is that the farther we go from the diagonal, the easier it seems to be corroborated. Or in other words, the hardest case is on the diagonal. So one doesn't have to do everything, but focus on this specific case, right? For larger and larger P now is probably the heart of the problem. We don't know much for many colors. And actually this table contains all lower bounds, all best lower bounds, which are non-trivial for three and one case for four colors. So what do we have now lower bound for these parameters, the best lower bound for these parameters. And here they go, all of them, you know, follow the, the conjecture because this is, you see, you move from diagonal, right? So you have four, four, you move one step from it to three, five, or any of the places here you take five, five, you move from the diagonal to four, six, and the best lower bound drops. Oh, time-wise, I'm doing fine, right? I have time. Yes, you still oh. have time, yep. Oh, no, 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 I have, as you can see, I'm, I barely passed the half of the slides, but I was considering skipping this slide, but I will not, namely, here is the link between the Shannon capacity of France and these limits. Now, I, I don't have time. Another talk, I can gladly talk about Shannon capacity work, but it's fascinating. Information theory people and, and some bizarre things are happening there. The Shannon capacity originally motivated by throughput, consecutive, throughput considerations in networks, which can be noisy, how much, what is the most we can send. My understanding now is that it does not have much impact on actual computer science, but became a delicious, wonderful problem in combinatorics and graph here. So the Shannon capacity is defined by this limit where g to power r is just the r power of the graph. The strong, using strong product, you do the, the number of vertices of g explodes, right? It's Cartesian product over and over again. So obviously you look at this limit and say, gee, that looks like the limit we had before. And yes, it is, right? So we had with Sheldon an interesting, I think, work which links the two. So LK is the limit we talked about before, and it is proven to be equal to the supremum of Shannon capacity of all graphs with independence less than K. Further, these limits are not achievable because in many cases of Shannon capacity, people wonder that some special graphs may hit the limit and all of them converge there as it happens, say with C5. So maybe the most famous case of, of the Shannon capacity studies the cycle of length five where 
squared of the cycle C5 does achieve, okay, and, and um, perhaps it's exceptional. Okay, but here we have a theorem that for this families, it's not achievable. So that was on the abstract side information theory. Let's go back to concrete Ramsey numbers and bounds. So we will look, okay, at increasing the number of colors, right? For three colors, right? The largest graph, complete graph, has 16 vertices, and there are exactly two colorings using three colors such that none of them have triangles. It's cool, this messy coloring from Wikipedia, right? You look at it and you spend a while and can confirm that none of colors has a monochromatic triangle. Now uh, the vertices on the right side and on the left side, you see they are the same. So that's rubbed, right? While in the bottom coloring, they are rubbed and twisted. And somehow Kalpach in 66 managed to prove that these are the only two colorings. This three colors on 16 and none on 17 exists. Now, there are nice explanations of this one once you switch to the Kletch graph, which is the description of the same, but using nice algebra. So, let's say we understand, and the three colors have been fully understood and analyzed by many. Four colors is open. And so here is the table of the best known lower and upper bounds on this number, four color numbers avoiding triangle. And as you can see, the story goes on for 70, almost 70 years now. The lower bound is going slowly up. It got stuck in 73. The upper bound, well, better goes down if we talk about progress. There's an interesting hiccup here. You see, there were false rumors long ago that people got it, but it was not confirmed. So the current state is 51 lower bound, 62 upper. And here, uh, simply, if you consider any successful coloring on at least 60 vertices using four colors, and that's the number of vertices, then necessarily the degrees of the vertices, the degrees of color, four colors would be one of the four tuples listed here. Now, it happens that for three colors, 16 and 15 vertices have only two colorings and they are beautiful. They have structure, they can be easily manipulated. Meaning that, you see, we did a good push on that with Petish and Kramer 2004, a while ago, where we disproved the existence of coloring on 62 vertices because the degree sequences are as listed here. A hint would be that, you see, we, we know much more, we know how to overlay graphs and actually let me hint recent Brendan's work was overlaying you know partial colorings with two colors right 
it is four colors. We know the components and the thing would be to look at how much of them can be overlaid. And my guess is that it's doable that the 61 and 60 could be analyzed. I'm not saying it's easy project, but likely doable. This case of four colors has a somewhat strange property that as far as I know, many heuristic searches or ad hoc constructions were attempted, but all of them fall far short from the best known. That, you know, people say in computer science, try to do these processes, heuristic processes which run around on computers over a long time and try to adjust the coloring so it pushes to more vertices. 51 is the result from a beautiful construction by uh, Chunk from 1973 and that's it. Now you would have to give very strong hints to the program, you know, how to make this construction because if you don't far less than 51 is achieved. This actually, you see, I when I talk to computer science people, I challenge them because you see assigning strategies to optimization searches is being done by many people in computer science. I tell them here is a challenge. You see, you can explain this problem in five minutes and to understand what the program should do, fake it quickly, right? So I told this to several people over time, but still I didn't see the general heuristics approaching this lower bound. And for the upper bound currently it's 62, but here I'm saying that very likely it can be pushed at least down to 60. Yep. And here we go to some, you know, less, but I would say equally fascinating problems in computing bounds and hopefully values of Ramsey numbers. So consider this table where we have K colors and the cycle length is M. And as far as I know, that's all what is known. Okay? We were talking about avoiding monochromatic triangles. That's the first column. And you look at this table and you see, gee, this looks like the hardest of all, right? One would think the smaller thing, analyzing triangles should be easier than others, but it's not so clear. Definitely there is dramatic division between odd and even, right? Avoiding say cycle C4 when using K columns is far better understood than avoiding trends. And this comes, you know, from interesting connection to geometry because there is this set or line point interpretation of uh, which in geometry, which leads to graphs avoiding C4 and those seem to do pretty well when looking at Ramsey that. So that's four pretty tight bounds. Five, we know much less. And for that matter, perhaps the most recent progress here that the upper bound on four color C5 was well over 100 for decades. And recently, Lidetsky with call for stay pushed it like chopped it in half to 77 using semi-definite program. It's still far from 33, which is 
um, obvious blow up construction for four colors, but uh, okay, so that's the situation for five. And then here is this, you know, jewel sitting in the middle, right? Five colors avoiding C6. The exact value is known. You look at it, it's, it's hard to believe what that's the case, right? It's by Sun Yong Ki and his group in Beijing. Uh, or what, perhaps some other such cases can be found. So now I want to switch to Folkman graphs, problems and numbers. What's that? In the answer so far or in the last 40 minutes, the graph app, which was arrowing even numbers or graphs, was the complete graph. What if this is a general graph? So consider arrowing operation, right? For graph app, arrowing numbers or graphs. And here I have a superscript of E of standing for the edges that you can consider coloring of edges or vertices. This leads to the set. In this case, I'm focusing on edge Folkman problems, but the, there is a whole set of problems related to vertices. So these are the edge Folkman graphs. And if you look for the one with the smallest number of vertices, well, you get the Folkman number. By beautiful work of Falkman, they exist. However, the clues from his truths are not leading to any good fun. So there is some work to do. Can we compute those and how and in which cases? First, observe the inverted role of lower and upper bounds with respect to Ramsey theorem. Right? The, in Folkman, we look for the smallest number of vertices so that arrowing still holds, while the lower bound would be claims about existence or not of the graph which does the arrow. So if you let it go and consider it as a problem in complexity, in classical complexity theory, so let FGH be graphs, and the task is to determine whether F arrows G and H, there are some classical results that this thing is uncomfortably high, namely in pi P2 level of polynomial hierarchy, which means, you know, this is almost certainly harder than NP. So maybe, you know, one should be not planning to solve the problem completely from algorithmic point of view. And that's just testing. You remember testing for Ramsey was kind of Trivial it was very easy, right? The lab in the first computing course. Here, well, you want to find the graph. Typically, graphs G and H are small. That's what you want to arrow and you hunt. You look for graph F. Now, for Ramsey, hunting for the graphs which are witnesses to lower bounds, now is hunting for graph F, which are witnesses to upper bounds. And we do not really know how to do the test for the other way. So it is becoming similarly hunting as in classical analysis, but much harder. 
And to summarize, the lower bounds are becoming just uh, almost hopeless, right? There are just some cases. Okay, obviously they, on the edge, there are cases where, where the values are known, but in principle, once you hit the hard parameters, any progress on lower bounds is very difficult. But there are interesting links to other parts, right? For example, classical results in which study the Ramsey arrowing are that if you want to arrow vertices from a graph G, then this graph must have chromatic number at least M, where M is the sum of these parameters subtracted one plus one. Similarly, if you aim at getting graph G, which E arrows these parameters, its chromatic number must be the Ramsey number of these parameters. So even for very moderately for bounded case, this M can be large, and thus you, you, you should focus attention to high chromatic graph G. This is just one of the directions. This is just one of the directions one can go. Uh, but there are others. So let me uh, point to the work by Professor Vascoro and his group who do look very carefully at special cases of arrowing. And there is a number of papers and I understand the number of people in your group interested in the area is growing. So I wish you great success. And, and yes, definitely that's very, nice direction to push it. On our part, we looked at these chromatic constraints and did the following. Okay, so let us consider Folkman numbers, but with a special constraint that the chi bounds are met exactly. And some results in this direction uh, were of them. I mean that this leads to the modified concept of Folkman numbers. Folkman numbers, we call them chromatic Folkman numbers, which are those where the bounds on chi are exactly as in these inequalities. Many people do Folkman theory without even mentioning Folkman, how it can be. Well, consider this note, right? G arrows two, 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 two with V. If and only if the chromatic number is R plus one, right? It means you cannot color the graph with R colors so that each pair of the vertices of the same color is disconnected. That's exactly chromatic number. So when you have two, it's the story of many, many people working over both. Huh? And one of the cool one of the very interesting problems started there is that what can or cannot be done when triangles are avoided. So it would be minimizing the number of vertices in triangles graphs with high chromatic numbers. Now, I do understand that, that the time is running, but as I 
I, I have like 15 minutes more, right? I'm not sure. Okay. So I will not go, these, these are fascinating developments. I will not go through the details here, but it goes over decades and it was thought for a while that the famous Michelski construction, which doubles the graph in X1 vertex in triangle-free case leads to, can lead to one more chromatic number and that that's the best, but we already know it's not. So from five to 11, you have two times five plus one and uh, it was broken by Jensen and Roy. And instead of 23, they found it's 22, but then Jan Huckeberg quite recently smashed the next case quite a lot because the Chelsky construction would be at 45 and he pushed it down to 40. No, simultaneously with the lower band. So this would be the first open case of the minimum number of triangle of vertices in triangle free graph with chromatic number six. Coming back to pure for pure. Folkman, well, if you have twos, that's chromatic number for vertices. Now, the smallest case where X arrowing is considered, which is non trivial, looks like this, right? Because we forbid now something more than change. So, K4 is the next. And what's the thing to arrow triangle? So, in other words, we are looking for the smallest order of a K4 free graph such that it arrows K3, K3, or it cannot be obtained as a union of two K3 graphs. I will not go through this table, but as the others, you know, it puts together the history of this case where the lower bound goes up and the upper bound goes down. So the current bounds are 21,786 and they may not look very well, but look what we had not long ago. The sizes of graphs considered were orders of magnitude. Love. This is important because this is the smallest set of parameters where the essence of this Folkman versus Ramsey thing matters. So these are the current bounds. The 786, we got, okay, like, wow, eight years ago by showing the arrowing of a certain graph obtained from residue graph using semi-definite programming. Oh, well, so it arrows K3, K3. Now we go 786, while there is still a price of $100 waiting for those who can make this graph 100 or less. That is, this can be very challenging task. On the other hand, the lower bound is crawling very, very slowly over many years. Lin, long ago, did it by hand. Hand vertices was the minimum, By right? There were five or so improvements right now. Fully computational approach by Bit of Nano from two years ago uh, showed that the lower bound is 20. But here is the a great computational challenge, namely consider this graph G127, which is classic, proposed in 80s in another context where the vertices are above 127 and two vertices are connected if the difference is a cube, 
marginal 127. It's a beautiful graph. Uh, Jeff actually conjectured that it does arrow 3 p that that's good for the focal number we were looking at the previous slide. So if <clears throat> correct, then the upper bound on this number is 127. It's a test of um, arrowing of a single graph it remains unknown. And let me warn you, it's not an afternoon or weekend project because many people look very hard trying to decide whether this arrowing holds or not. And no, it resists everything. This graph is something special. It's small from computational point of view. It's not big. It resists. Well, the methods which were used in the field, like eigenvalue methods, SDP, or the best such solvers. Yeah, it has amazingly rich structure. Thus, there is hope that maybe some great insight into this graph can permit to decide whether this arrowing holds. Or not. And let me <clears throat> for for the last problem I want to describe. Let let us go as follows. Let us consider both vertex and edge Falcon numbers with arbitrary graphs. What what I mean here now. We want to consider H3 graphs, right, only. And we ask, which of them arrow H1, H2, both in the vertex and uh, cases. So the classics talks about complete graphs. That's what you find in textbooks mostly, right? They plug in complete graphs and beautiful theory emerges. But what if we look at more details? Like already for very small age, even the existence of these graphs is in question. So I will point to two cases and ask everybody to work on another, but you pick a very small age, well, even H1, H2, most of the time are triangles and very difficult questions can be built on that. For example, we have proven that what the statement Fe, K3, K3, BK does not exist for K equal three. Well, BK is the book. Right, is the book which is this classical one vertex, right? Or let's say triangular, K triangular. Uh, is that right? Yes, yes. So for three, for, for B3, we have a proof that arrowing cannot help. If a graph does not have B3, then cannot arrow B3. But for K equal four, it's already open. So the question would be decide, does there exist a B4 free graph which arrows B3? In the other direction, very strange things happen. Like you can forbid say K4, but ask, something else than complete graph to the arrow. And really the only interesting case I'm aware of, of, of this approach is 15 years old, upper bound on this arrow. So a graph on that many, 30,000 class vertices was constructed, which does arrow K4 minus E. 
It's too much probably, but in general, if these are close to each other, you can expect the number to be large. So I'm not aware of much exploration of other cases or mixtures where, where these are, you know, coming from, from larger set of graphs, right? These are sporadic cases. So this I understand, yes, this is my last slide with mathematical content. Uh, Fairly simple reason permits to claim that these edge Boltzmann numbers exist for all H containing K4. So if you forbid something more than K4, then yes, the arrowing holds, but how much is that? Oh, well, for each graph, one can wonder, you know, how much that could be. So what we did is look carefully at all cases not containing K4. And we were lucky to classify all of them. Well, except two cases listed here. So the Falcon number in question or a graph which is H3 but arrows Three, three. It is decided whether it exists or not for all graphs on for all connected graphs on five vertices except these two. This is the wheel, right? One simple vertex connected to four of C four, and this is the complement of P two union two. Now well, clearly W5 is nicer and more elegant. So here is a problem. Oh, one of the problems, right? If you go to, to our paper, there are other stated, but I would say this is the most elegant one. Consider graphs which do not contain W5. So does there exist any graph W5 free which arrows three three? Well, we don't know. Well, thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Professor Razisowski, for a very interesting and a lot of uh, information about the Ramsey number and also uh, variations of Ramsey numbers. So uh, we will move to the question and answer uh, session. But before that, uh, I think Eddie will have uh, music to play okay. for all of us here. Okay, so th thank you. So thanks again to Professor Rasisowski. So this is, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I promised uh, in the earlier uh, to Professor Rasisowski to, uh, uh, to give uh, or to present a traditional uh, music uh, performance, which is uh, Anklung. Yeah. So uh, I will show now let me see so this performance uh, performed by our student uh, with the title is uh, manuk dadali this is uh, actually a west west java song yeah manuk dadali means uh, our uh, national bird of uh, garuda the uh, symbol of indonesia Okay, let me. Thank you. 
Okay. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this uh, music. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> this this music uh, come from Anklong performance, uh, Anklong uh, instrument, and but now we have uh, in uh, uh, in electronic one. <laughs> so the phones yes. simulate the, phone. the yes. sound. The yeah, sound. that's true. That's yes, true. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's made from bamboo, actually, in the instrument, yeah. Anklong instrument. Okay, okay, Reno. Okay, thank you, Pak pa Edi. Uh, so there are already uh, several questions in the chat room. Uh, the first two questions are from Hesun Lee. Uh, so Hesun Lee, do you want to ask your question again or should I just read your question here? Uh, in page nine, uh -huh. what is avoiding K, K and KL? Hmm. Just for clarification. Well, do not contain the graph, the complete graph on K. But avoiding me, do not ah. contain. Okay. Given color. Another and question. I, oh. I see LP attack, right? That's LP stands for linear program. Mm -hmm. that you collect data on smaller graphs and put together often large instance of linear programming, which sometimes hopefully says that graphs with properties we look for do not exist. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Hesunli, for the questions. Um, the next question were from uh, Brandon, Professor Brandon McKay. Uh, do you want to ask the question again? Uh, yes. Uh, a very nice talk, Stashik. Um, you define L3 as a limit of a sequence, but why must it have a limit even if the limit is infinite? Why can't it oscillate, for example? Is oh, it, is it oh infinite sequence? and then go down to finite. No, no, it could say go between two finite values, up and down, forever. You mean L3? For example, yes. There, there is no, there is monotonicity argument. Ah, by okay. That okay. It, it does I show. I suspected it, but it's, it's not obvious, perhaps. It's not obvious, but, but it is in the seventh paper from 70s by Chunk. And actually generalizes to, to NLK. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Uh, is there any other question? Can, can I have one? Yes. <laughs> okay. Bye, so, uh, so then, thank you very much uh, for the uh, very nice and inspiring talk, Professor Rasisowski. I, I just wonder. Uh, do you also compute the Ramsey numbers for uh, trees and uh, versus wheel? Trees versus, versus wheel. wheel. Yeah. Uh, because in, in your survey, uh, only uh, little uh, known about that. And also uh, Ramsey numbers uh, wheel versus wheel as well. Yeah. There is, okay, so wheel versus wheel. Yeah. Actually, Brendan had in, you know, the last significant progress on ah, that okay. was by Brendan with Ralph Podri, right? Correct. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there were improvements on some bounds later, but not very large. They got the exact value. I see. Now, so that's wheels versus wheels. And I think the data up to date is collected in the survey. Now, trees versus wheels is yeah. a different question. I myself did not attempt this problem, but I understand there is hope to get, you know, exact results in at least in hmm. many cases. So maybe yeah, yeah. if you see 
I, I welcome suggestions of additions to my survey. And if you see that something is missing, that would be great. Please send me and I will actually, I am getting ready to, to mm -hmm. work on the next revision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, in, in particular for Will with, uh, uh, with uh, old uh, fetishes, with even fetishes, uh i think will be the same as the uh lower bone of uh Kofatra and harari the, yeah. the, right there is this yeah. split okay starting with cycles but this carries through to wheels that there is this this thing okay the case even in odd cases even, they yeah. behave in distinct way right Okay. But to you and anybody who who listens, right? If you have any suggestions that I'm missing something or should be added or or something is wrong in the survey, please by all means let me know. And that's how I manage to do it. Thanks to help for everybody everywhere. Actually, I got many, many suggestions over time, and I welcome them very much. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you, Paedi. Is there any other question? Uh, no question. So if there is no question, let's thank Professor Aziz Soski for a very nice talk tonight. Okay. And I will give the screen back to Paedi. Okay, so thanks again to Professor uh, Aziz Soski for wonderful talks uh, today. And uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Natural Sciences, I would like to present you, Professor Rasesowski, a certificate uh, of uh, this uh, 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 lecture. So let me show you the certificate. Okay, so this is uh, the certificate. And I also uh, give you some uh, special uh, pictures uh, for uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, saying our grateful to uh, to you uh, for the willingness to be a speaker in this event. So thanks again uh, on behalf of ITB uh, to uh, your willingness uh, to be a speaker. So these two uh, uh, documents I will uh, send you uh, by email, uh, one of the certificate and then the other one is uh, this one. Okay, so uh, now it comes to the end of, let's see, uh, just a moment. Oh. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so we, we come to the end of this uh, uh, lectures, the series. So again, thank you, Professor Rasesowski. Thank you, Professor Brendan McKay, Professor Kiki, and uh, all others uh, who are attending this uh, event. So uh, again, uh, probably we, we will meet uh, next, uh, next month for this event, so with a different speaker. So thanks, thank you uh, very much. Yeah, bye-bye from now. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Okay. and everybody who attended. Okay, <laughs> terima kasih, terima <laughs> kasih, Professor uh, Rasesowski. Terima kasih, Brendan. Okay. So, thank you, Brandon. Everyone. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye and good night and good morning to <laughs> Professor Rasiskowski. <laughs> good morning and good night.
<laughs> Terima kasih Ibu Kiki. Thank you, Ibu Kiki. Ibu Kiki. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Uh-huh. So it's, it's it's nice to have you uh, in the <laughs> early in the early morning there now <laughs> in Australia, Brandon. No, no, it's not uh, morning. No, no it's it is in the evening. It's now okay. almost midnight. Yes, yeah. yeah, so oh, almost, almost midnight. midnight. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, okay. So, okay. terima kasih, Bu Rino. Thank you. Yeah. See you again. Okay. Okay. See you again. See you. Bye. See you again. Yeah. Bye bye, Brandon. Yeah.